Hello everyone and welcome to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. Today we're going to continue talking about population movement, just talk about some key terms and some different ideas that we refer to when we're, we talk about um, studying uh, population movement. So when we talk about the movement of people, we talk about the reasons why they might move from one place to another. Uh, we have what are called push factors and pull factors. Uh, so when you look at those terms, push factors and pull factors, you know, they they uh, are pretty much exactly what you might consider them to be. Push factors are things that are going to uh, push people out or cause them to leave. And pull factors are going to be things that uh, bring people to a particular area. So they're going to attract them to a specific area. So when you think about push factors, why someone leaves, you know, we could uh, really consider any number of reasons. There could be something about the place itself that maybe the people find undesirable. You could have uh, maybe a change in governments uh, where uh, you know, you move from a, a more democratic government to a more socialist or communist form of government, so people feel like they are, uh, you know, the direction of the country is not going very well, so they might move. You might uh, find a situation where uh, maybe the economy has gone bad, and so people can't find jobs, so they might move. Uh, people feel like maybe they don't, uh, maybe we talk, like we talked about earlier, maybe the neighborhood is changing and they're not too... I'm not too thrilled with the direction that things are going, uh, you know, because they may now they feel like outsiders, the local government does not reflect their values, things like that, so they might get up and move. Uh, so again, there are any number of things that can cause people to leave a particular place, just like there are any number of things that can cause people to be attracted to a particular place. But then when you look at push factors and pull factors, pull factors are going to be almost the exact opposite of what push factors are. Typically, um, pull factors are going to be uh, a good economy, uh, a freer, more open society and government that's going to allow people to participate and practice uh, their particular set of beliefs or uh, they're not going to undergo government persecution. Um, maybe it's a better education system, maybe it's lower taxes. Uh, any of these types of things might be uh, pull factors that are going to attract different groups of people. And when we talk about the movement of people, there's what we call migration selectivity. And so when we look at this particular term what we're referring to is how likely someone is to migrate and when we look at uh, specific individuals we find that they're actually uh, we, we could actually narrow it down in terms of who is probably most likely to migrate when we look at a uh, when we look at a particular population now migration selectivity is going to be based on a couple of specific things it can be based upon the personal uh, attributes of an individual the social uh, position that the person finds them in, and also their economic status. When we talk about personal, this is referring uh, uh, to things like are they single or are they married? Um, you know, how old are they? Are they fairly young? Are they middle aged? Are they older? Uh, the social, the social element is uh, what part of uh, society are they in? Are they kind of the upper class? Are they the lower class? Things like that. And economic. Uh, is looking at uh, what what economic position are they in? Are they wealthy or are they poor? Uh, so typically, when you look at these things like migration selectivity, uh, your the personal uh, mostly uh, younger uh, younger single males are more likely to move, uh, and those who have more money are more likely to move than those who have less money. Um, people who don't have families, uh, is, as far as uh, you know, don't have extended families and things like that in the area, much more likely to move than those who have um, families in the area. The, the less ties you have to a place, the more likely it is that somebody is going to move. And when we look at uh, migration selectivity, we actually find that age is going to be the thing that is uh, most likely to be the best indicator of when or why somebody is going to move or what group of people are most likely to move. So you think about ages, uh, typically, people between the ages of 18 and 30 are going to be the ones most likely to move. So if you think about what's going on in that age range, it makes a lot of sense because there's really a lot going on in somebody's life in the, uh, between the ages of 18 and 30. Um, in the United States, this is the time when people are uh, going off to college, people are starting their careers, people are starting families, uh, maybe somebody has joined the military, and so they're going to be going off doing those things. Uh, and also, you know, at 18, now they're less likely to be uh, tied down to a particular place, so a little bit freer in their movements. But of course, by the time they hit 30, uh, they probably settled down. Uh, they probably have gotten a job, maybe started a family, so they're much less likely to move after that. And of course, prior to 18, 
you really don't have the financial wherewithal and the level of independence in order to enable one to move from uh, to a new particular place. When we talk about uh, movement, there's a term called brain drain, which is of great uh, is of great worry to to governments, whether it be local governments or national governments. And the reason that brain drain uh, is such a concern is because uh, what brain drain is is when really your your most educated people are more more likely to leave a place. So you think about the position that more educated people find themselves in. Obviously. Uh, they're more desirable in terms of the job market. Not only that, but they're more aware of the opportunities that are out there. And so um, you have a situation where, especially in places that are uh, not very well developed or are struggling to develop and things like that, they really want to keep uh, their most educated there because those are the people that are most likely to help them move to new stages of development to bring uh, maybe some uh, some better decision makers into uh, into the area and uh, help them to progress and move forward, uh, and so it's it's it's, it's almost a cyclical problem that even though you get maybe well educated, very smart people, you know they want to they want to go off and they want to be successful, and especially in especially in undeveloped areas, it's gonna be very difficult for uh, those particular locations to provide with them with the opportunities uh, that they might desire. So they're gonna go off to the places where they can find those opportunities to make use of their talents. Uh, and so again, it was this idea, the brain drain is this idea um, that the most educated people, the most capable people, actually leave the place that they're at. And so, um, because this is such a worry of of governments, governments are going to try and do things to keep their most educated and their most talented and capable people in the area. So they want to keep those workers from leaving. So they might try to offer them incentives to keep them in that particular place, whether it's uh, you know, maybe offer them jobs in the government, or maybe offer them different educational incentives, or uh, you know, things along those lines, uh, to try and keep them from moving from the place, so that uh, they will stay and they will help to uh, they will help to create um, development, advancement, and prosperity for their uh, particular uh, their particular location. Uh, the one thing that I think about is in the state of Georgia we have what's called the Hope Scholarship and a lot of states have something similar to this and so basically the Hope Scholarship is this scholarship program that pays for most of the tuition and books uh, for Georgia's top students. I can't remember what the grade point average is that you have to have um, when you exit high school but you also have to maintain it in college. So of course the idea there is to try and make college more affordable uh, but target it specifically to uh, some, of the, some of the better students. And so try to keep those in the state to try to create um, better numbers for our in-state universities and, and colleges. And, and then, of course, the hope is once they graduate, not only do our universities and colleges look really good, but then they'll go off to work for companies that are in the state of Georgia. And that might even attract uh, companies that to the state of Georgia so that they'll hopefully bring their businesses, we grow the economy, things along those lines. Uh, so if you think about it in those terms, um, those are some different... Uh, some different policies. Now, of course, some governments like the Soviet Union, communist governments in the past would refuse to allow some of their best and their brightest to leave, but we're, uh, we're more looking at some of the freer decisions that locations and governments might create uh, in order to, to retain some of their best and their brightest. And when we look at uh, migration itself, we can classify migration in two different ways. We can have what's called voluntary migration, where one uh, gets up and leaves on their own volition, and that's where we can kind of gauge the reasons why people might leave a place. Uh, and then we have what's called involuntary or forced migration. Now, involuntary or forced migration can be uh, one of two things. It can be either forced by the people in the area, or it can be forced maybe by uh, the environmental conditions. Is there some sort of uh, environmental disaster? You think about tsunamis or earthquakes. Uh, you think about Hurricane Katrina that we had here in the United States several years ago things that are going to force people to move from their place. And when we look at uh, groups of uh, involuntary migrants, we have a specific classification of people that we call uh, refugees. And these are essentially invol involuntary migrants who have been forced to leave their particular area. And a lot of time, and, and most of the times, uh, refugees are going to be uh, become refugees because they are facing some sort of persecution uh, from 
uh, from their local government. And so that's what's going to force them to leave the place. Now, the term refugee is very important because refugees are provided certain provisions and certain statuses under uh, international provisions and laws and things like that. Uh, so again, refugees are people typically who flee some sort of re uh, persecution or abuse. Sometimes we refer to uh, people who undergo some sort of environmental disaster refugees. Several years ago when Hurricane Katrina came through, people coming from New Orleans were considered refugees. And so different states would help uh, set up programs and the, and the American government set up programs to help resettle those people, uh, things like that. So when we look at refugees, um, we have international refugees, which those are people who flee from one country to another. And this is the actual definition of a refugee. A refugee must uh, be forced to flee uh, from their country to another country and actually cross that administrative border. And, that'll, and we'll see why that's important in just a second. Otherwise, you have what's called an international refugee. This is someone who moves within the country. And technically, this type of person is what's called an IDP or an inter internally displaced person. And this is really important, as I'll show you in just a second. So again, uh, when we talk about refugees, the official term for refugee is stated by the United Nations, someone who flees to another country. So when we look at this map here, we can see uh, some of the trends of, uh, of refugees and where they come from and where they're fleeing to. And of course, you notice that some of the places that have some of the greatest uh, turmoils and also less developed, least developed countries are some of the places where you have some of the greatest uh, movement of refugees from one place to another. Uh, and so uh, typically economic depression, uh, social unrest, things like that are going to be major indicators. And of course the important thing is here not just to notice where they're coming from, but they can then begin to uh, look at well, who's moving from one place to the other and then investigate why it is that they're moving from that place to another. So as I mentioned just a second ago, this is a really important idea to keep up with because the United Nations uh, does not recognize the internally displaced person technically as a refugee. So somebody who's moving within their own country has been displaced. They have what's called the, it, they become then what's called an internally displaced person and not technically a refugee. And so refugee, uh, internally displaced persons are refugees who do not move across the administrative boundary to a new country. Uh, and it's, again, they are essentially refugees in everything but uh, but name. So they, they face all the hardships of a refugee. They typically are undergoing the same sort of persecution. However, they're not given refugee status by the United Nations. And the problem with this is, is the internally displaced persons are supposed to be dealt with by the internal government of wherever those people are from. The problem there is that more than likely that internal government is the one doing the persecution of the IDP. So it creates a serious conflict there. Uh, and so you see down here at the bottom it says international support and aid is not required. Uh, and so that means that nobody really has to or is supposed to reach out and help to provide for the IDP. Whereas if a refugee moves across country boundaries, then uh, countries are supposed to set up refugee camps. The United Nations can come in and help out and provide food aid and things like that. And so the real trouble that this causes is that some countries will actually block refugees from coming into their country because they do not want to have to deal with the logistical and the financial issues of setting up refugee camps, protecting people, things like that. And you've seen, uh, you've seen several instances of this, uh, especially in places like Cambodia and Thailand, where Thailand has been uh, taking on large numbers of Cambodians for a number of years and um, in, order to, uh, in order to keep from having to continue to provide for these people that actually block access of Cambodians who might be fleeing the country, um, uh, especially uh, whether it was a communist persecution or right now you have a, a, an ethnic issue going on in Cambodia with people called the Karen people. Um, and so the, uh, the Thai government has actually blocked those people from coming in. Um, and so that's the definite, that's the problem you have there with this definition of refugee and internally displaced persons. All right, so that's it for this time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, come back next time and we'll be talking a little bit more about migrations and specific migration trends to the United States.